I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, thinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now saved am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. All my heart to Him I give, ever to Him I'll cling. In His blessed presence live, ever His praises sing. Love so mighty and so true, merits my soul's best song. Faithful, loving service to, to Him belong. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help. Love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Lord, we thank you for this evening, knowing that love lifted all of us, that came in the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, as he works in our everyday life. We give him all the praise for providing our needs. And Lord, as we take this offering to meet the needs of our church, we thank you for that. We ask this in his name, amen. We have a couple of young ladies here.
Thank you, ladies. Beautiful. Every once in a while, we get to steal some, uh, some of uh, the folk from the our youth program, and that's always a blessing to us. And what a most appropriate and beautiful heart cry. You wonder, of course, the song is uh, sung from the perspective of a Christian, but really, those words lead to both salvation and sanctification, and. Certainly beyond salvation, you wonder if there's anything more blessed for the Lord to hear and have issue from our hearts than that. Lord, I'm yours. I completely and totally surrender myself to you and to your service. What a, what a great prospect. May that be our heart cry uh, tonight. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the ministry. Thank you for the way that you've uh, blessed and challenged our hearts already tonight. We love our communion Sunday evenings, and we love uh, every aspect of our Sunday evening service. We love our music. We love this hymn, this heart cry, I surrender all, and, and, uh, and it's got inherent in it a very significant challenge that I trust will heed and embrace. In fact, I wonder if there's anything better than this for us to leave tonight with that actually being a reality. But Lord, that funnels down into our hearts and lives in very practical ways, including what we do with your word. And so we're back to recognizing that a good student not only studies and, and uh, is aided by the Holy Spirit of God, in order to understand your truth, but it is also the Holy Spirit of God that empowers us to implement your truth into our lives. And uh, we know that that's crucial. And James continues to keep that on a front burner for us. And for that, we're glad. And even though we have been hovering over a text and complete our observations tonight over a text that deals with the wicked rich, we at every turn have been seeing principles that are very much applicable to us, to all of us, to each of us, and for that, we are glad. So continue to set the record straight for us. Open our eyes, open our hearts, open our lives, we pray, Lord, for the reception of your truth, we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. Well, our study in uh, James continues. One more session, please, uh, tonight on chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, where James, as you know, issues a warning to the wicked rich. It's a warning of future divine judgment. Uh, take a look as I read uh, one more time now, James 5, verses 1 through 6. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. For your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten, and your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your and show each your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, cries. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Ye have lived in pleasure on earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. The judgment that James speaks of here, I remind you, centers on two things. One, how the wicked rich came about their riches. We saw that in verse 4. And then two, how the wicked rich subsequently used their riches, verses 5 and 6. We looked at verse 5 last week. 
And tonight we consider verse 6. I am rereading verses 5 and 6. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. And here's verse 6. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Uh, we noted at the end of last uh, week's session that James employs an interesting play on words here in verse 6. I want you to hang on to that for a couple of minutes. Certainly want to observe with you what we have on the surface and what is obviously here presented to us. James continues to critique the wicked rich man's dealings, especially his dealings with those who are in his hire. Uh, the language is grave and graphic. Uh, so much so that it's hard for us today, especially with all the legislation, and I'm saying this positively, especially with all the legislation that has been established to protect the employee. But we still see enough, and you perhaps have experienced, at least in measure, some of these things, even in the workplace. But James says to the wicked rich, you have condemned and killed the just. You've probably already noted this, but the word condemned here is actually a jurisprudence term. It takes us, once again, into the courtroom. In other words, here is the wicked rich employer, and he's taken his just employee to court. And because of his clout, that is the clout of the rich man, because of his riches, because of his resources, because of his power, he invariably wins, the ruling is invariably in his favor. James actually alerted us to this kind of scenario earlier in the epistle. Look back at uh, James 2 and verse 6 where James wrote, You recall, but ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats. So this is something that's, that certainly was unfolding on somewhat a regular basis as uh, James writes his epistle. And we, we note at James' prompting that the, the rich man's persecution of the poor and the powerless sometimes even leads to death. Again, that'd be foreign to us today in our culture, but it, it wasn't then. We do have some historical precedents in regard to that. I couldn't help but think of the Holocaust victims. Many of them were literally worked to death, not figuratively, but literally worked to death. I couldn't help but think of some of the Old Testament prophets. You know, sometimes I, you know, you guys maybe are beyond this, but sometimes we get, uh, you know, discouraged. In, in, even in ministry. We get discouraged with the trials and tribulations and troubles of life. And I've noted with you on many occasions, you know, we, we often are like stuck pigs. We do an awful lot of squawking. We, uh, you, you know, are uh, ready at any given time to throw in the towel. Figure that nobody's seen the sorrow and troubles that we have seen and and you think about the Old Testament prophets and their commission by God. And many of them literally gave their lives, you know, in faithfulness to that commission. And I often think of the heroes of faith in Hebrews 11. That was a Sunday evening study. And uh, we, God moved our hearts in, in regard to many of hero, heroes of faith. And of course, you know, one of my ministerial life texts is Hebrews 12, and, uh, you know, 1 through 4, and you get down to verses 3 and 4, and, you know, I've done this with you many times. Uh, you, you know, it's as if Christ says, uh, take a look and see if you're shedding martyr's blood. And if not, then keep going. If not, then be encouraged in ministry. If not, then realize that... Uh, what you are experiencing is the common lot of all of God's people and that many of God's people have incurred a much greater cost than what you have incurred. And one other thing along those lines, um, 
It's interesting to read James' inspired writing here in verse 6 with a view to his subsequent martyrdom. I have interesting bedtime stories for you, right? I, I have interesting bedtime stories, you know, probably stories that, you know, you wouldn't actually choose to have as a bedtime story. This is from Martyr's Mirror. I thought you'd be interested in rehearsing with me the story of James. Again, this is graphic, and I think that you will join me in ultimately being encouraged even through the graphic nature of the thing. The heading, again, from Martyr's Mirror. The heading, James, the son of Alphaeus, or brother of the Lord, cast down from the temple, stoned and beaten to death with a club in AD 63. James the Lesser was the son of Alphaeus and mother, and Mary, Cleophas, sister to the mother of Christ. He is called the Lord's brother. After proper instruction, he was ordained an apostle by Christ and sent out to minister to the Jews, wherein he acquitted himself well until Christ's death. After that, you know this is the author of the epistle, right? You, you know that, right? He was sent out to minister to Jews wherein he acquitted himself well until Christ's death. After that, he with others was sent out to preach the gospel which he did in the Jewish church. And although Peter and James and his brother John, of whom the last mentioned two were the sons of Zebedee, were regarded as the special apostles, he was nevertheless considered to be one of the three pillars of the church after the death of James, the son of Zebedee. He was appointed by the apostles the first overseer of the church at Jerusalem. Can you imagine pastoring the church in Jerusalem? This was shortly after the death of Christ. This office he discharged faithfully for 30 years, converting many to the true faith, not only through principally by the pure doctrine of Christ, but also through his holy life, on account of which he was called the just. This apostle wrote an epistle for the consolation of the twelve tribes who were scattered abroad, saying, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. That's James 1, 1 and 2. But although he comforted with many excellent reasons his own, who believed in the name of Christ, the unbelieving Jews could not endure his doctrine. So Ananias, an audacious and cruel young man among them, being the high priest, summoned him before the judges that they should compel him to deny that Jesus is the Christ and force him to renounce the Son of God and the power of his resurrection. To this end, the chief priests, scribes, and Pharisees placed him upon the pinnacle of the temple at the time of the Passover, that he should deny his faith before all the people. But as he thus stood before the people, he confessed with much more boldness that Jesus Christ is the promised Messiah, the Son of God, our Savior, and that he is sitting at the right hand of God and shall come again in the clouds of heaven to judge the quick and the dead. On account of this testimony of James, the multitude of the people praised God and magnified the name of Christ, then cried the enemies of the truth, Oh, the just also has erred. Let us take him away, for he is unprofitable. They accordingly cast him down and stoned him. But as he was not killed by the fall and the stoning, having only broken his legs, he, lying on his knees, prayed to God for those who stoned him, saying, Lord, forgive them, for they know not what they do. On account of this, one of the priests begged for his life, saying, What do ye? The just is praying for us. Leave off stoning, but another of those present who held a fuller stick in his hand struck him over the head with it so that he died and fell asleep in the Lord. This occurred A.D. 63 in the 96th year of his age, in the seventh year of the reign of Nero, during an interim in the governorship between the death of Festus and arrival of Alabinus under the high priest Ananias who perpetrated this lamentable deed on James. Concerning this James, the following is said. He was on his bare knees so often and for so, such long periods praying to the Lord God 
for the remission of the sins of the people that his knees were so hard and callous that there was no sensation in them at all. A number of things that struck me by uh, rehearsal of that account of uh, James the Apostle's martyrdom is the fact that he was referred by his enemies as the just one. Take a look at verse 6 again. Ye have condemned and killed the just one, and he doth not resist you. But there's something else here as well. I mentioned to you, and that actually is not the play on words, even though I suppose that that would qualify as well. I, I mentioned to you earlier that there's an interesting play on words here employed by James. We read verse 6 and are quick to think of powerless uh, employees and persecuted poor. And indeed, we should. Context absolutely demands that. But what's interesting here is James' use of a singular noun in referencing the just. Let me uh, show you and tell you how verse 6 literally reads. James writes, you, plural. He's referring to the wicked rich. He says, you, plural, have condemned and killed. And then this phrase is very interesting. And here's the play on words, reflecting not only on James, but James' greater brother, if you know what I mean. He says, you have killed, and then in the original language, you would see the definite article, and so you say the or the. He says, you have killed the just one. Definite article, the just one. Singular noun. James has employed the plural noun both in regard to the wicked rich, but also in regard not just to the employers, but also in regard to the employees. And yet we get to verse 6, and all of a sudden he is talking singularly of the, definite article, the just one. So it reads like this, you plural, reflecting on the wicked rich, have condemned and killed the just one, singular noun, and he, singular noun, does not resist you, plural noun. You have probably already envisioned Christ here. But let me tell you something wonderful, and please understand and appreciate the biblical warrant for this. We often say that Christ is at every turn. We often say that every single word right from the get-go ultimately points to the Lord Jesus Christ. But here we are hovering over a text and specifically a verse in James 5 and verse 6 where the grammar demands that we move in our mind's eye from the plural poor persecuted and the plural um, uh, just employ ease to the just one who is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. I know you know this, but I've been looking forward to saying this to you actually for an extended period of time. The only one who really was ever just was the Lord Jesus Christ. And the only way that you and I could ever be just is by having a personal relationship with the just one. We are among the just only because we know the just one. We have been declared righteous, you know the term well, imputation. <clears throat> we have been declared righteous. It's a court setting. In contrast to what James is speaking of here, where the powerless poor were taken into the court system, where the just was um, uh, deemed jurisprudently as being unjust, we have been declared righteous only because of our relationship with the righteous one. 
we have been working our way through classic Isaiah 53. I love the way that, uh, that God, for me, brought all of these things together, and especially this being our communion Sunday evening. And we, you know, we're wrapping up our considerations, I, I believe orchestrated by the Spirit of God in regard to this uh, significant text, James 5, verses 1 through 6. But we've also been working our way uh, through classic Isaiah 53 as a prelude to our time of uh, communion. And if Isaiah impresses upon us anything concerning the Savior, and he impresses upon us many things, it is the fact of Christ's absolute and genuine innocence. We know the Lord Jesus Christ to be the spotless, blemishless Lamb of God and of necessity because a sinner cannot bear the penalty of another's sin. You've heard it said many times, and you have because of the truth of it, that we can only pay for our sins, and if we choose to do that, it will take all of eternity in hellfire. Thank you, God, that there was someone who not only desired to pay for our sin, but was in a position to actually do it through his substitutionary death on Calvary's cross. Isaiah 43, 4 and 5, Surely he hath borne our griefs, he has carried our sorrows, and yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Listen to a summation of the other things Isaiah writes in 53. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter for the transgression of the people he has been stricken. He did no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. God made him an offering for our sin. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. We are justified tonight because of a personal relationship with the one and only just one. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we rejoice in you again tonight. And once again, we uh, appreciate the way that you've knit the service together, full circle back to our time of communion. And here it's been prompted by James as he references the just one, he makes a, an interesting shift in his use of grammar where all of a sudden we are no longer thinking about the multitude of poor who are being persecuted, but we are thinking of the one and only just one. And so most appropriate, we are left with the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh God, may we continue to keep our eyes fixed on the author and finish of our faith and may people hear and see that in us. I pray for Jesus' sake, amen. Let's turn over to 453, please, in our hymnal and close with the first verse of I'll Live for Him. Mm -hmm. 453. My life, my love, I give to thee, the Lamb of God who died for me. Oh, may I ever faithful be, my Savior and my God. I'll live for him who died for me. How happy then my life shall be. I'll live for him who died for me. My 
say.